ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the special session for practical measures to avoid conflict at sea. Um, we have a distinguished uh, panel here of uh, representatives from Vietnam, Japan, the United States, and China. Uh, my name is uh, Nick Childs. I'm the senior fellow for Naval Forces and Maritime Security at the International Institute for Strategic Studies. Um, a couple of um, housekeeping points before we uh, uh, kick off the session, and I invite the, the panelists to make some opening remarks. Uh, first of all, this session is on the record. Uh, and secondly, uh, because we are here in the ballroom where the plenary sessions are held, we will adopt the same procedure when it comes to the discussion uh, process um, at, uh, after the initial remarks as in the plenary sessions. So using the, uh, the microphone um, positions that uh, you have in front of you on the desks and Yes, it's, it's written there, but I'll, I'll, I'll go through it again briefly. Um, uh, delegates, tap your name badge on the left-hand side of the, uh, of the microphone position. If you want to, uh, to join the queue, as it were, you'll be presented with a couple of arrows on uh, the screen, then either right or left, depending on where you sit on the shared, shared uh, units. Um, press one of those, uh, and then either the left-hand side button or the uh, right-hand side silver button to uh, join the queue. Your microphone will then go green uh, to indicate that uh, you're joining the queue, but it won't, won't be live. When we come to the session and I, I call on you, um, I will um, uh, invite you to speak. The microphone will uh, turn red and you will be live and, and make your contributions. Uh, I think some of those, those of you in the front rows, you don't share mics so you don't have to choose right or left um, for, the, for that part of the process. Um, that's from a technical side uh, all I have to say. Um, clearly maritime issues have already figured prominently uh, in the plenary sessions of our conference uh, summit so far, as indeed they have in past uh, years as well, a reflection clearly of the um, stakes involved. Globally, the maritime domain has become more congested, more contested, and, and more complex, complex in the sense of the character of frictions uh, that are involved, but also in the number of potential actors out there beyond just traditional navies. The term gray zones has become uh, a common currency. This region itself has its share of frictions as we've been hearing, but also some of the templates or potential templates uh, like the code on unplanned encounters at sea that others in other regions are looking at as possible models for the future. And potentially we, we may hear this afternoon something on which to, to build for the future. So without further ado, I will uh, invite, as I say, the panelists to make some opening remarks um, in the order in which they appear in the um, agenda that you, you have before you. So first, on my extreme right, I'd, li I'd like to ask uh, Senior Lieutenant General Professor Dr. Bu Van Nam, Deputy Minister in the Ministry of Public Security in Vietnam. He's held that post since 2009. Um, so, if you'd like to uh, open our proceedings, thank you. Uh, thưa ngài chủ tịch uh, phiên họp, uh, thưa quý ông quý bà, trước hết xin cảm ơn ngài tiến sĩ John Chairman và WS WS đã cho tôi cơ hội tham dự và phát biểu phiên họp đặc biệt số 4 với chủ đề các biện pháp thực tế nhằm tránh xung đột trên biển. Thưa quý vị, tất cả chúng ta ở đây đều nhất trí về tầm quan trọng của an ninh trên biển đối với hòa bình, ổn định và phát triển ở khu vực châu Á-Thái Bình Dương thân yêu của chúng ta. Gần đây, những tranh chấp biển đảo ở khu vực có phần lắng dịu hơn, nhưng chúng ta đều cảm thấy tình hình vẫn đang diễn biến phức tạp, tiềm ẩn nguy cơ cao. Tranh cấp chủ quyền là nguồn chính tạo ra rủi ro, xung đột, và xung đột trên biển. Tất cả chúng ta đều không mong muốn xung đột xảy ra, 
bởi một khi xung đột đã xảy ra, tất cả các bên đều thua. Do vậy, các biện pháp thực tế nhằm tránh xung đột trên biển đều cần loại bỏ các nguyên nhân và hành vi gây rủi ro xung đột trên biển, theo chúng tôi có thể là. Thứ nhất, cần thống nhất rằng mọi tranh chấp bất đồng trên biển không nên và không thể được giải quyết bằng vũ lực. Mọi hành động vũ lực đều xảy ra không chỉ những hậu quả trước mắt mà còn để lại những di chứng khó có thể khắc phục được trong dài hạn. Việt Nam đã trải qua chiến tranh, chúng tôi hiểu rất rõ điều này. Để giảm thiểu nguy cơ xung đột, các bên cần luôn giữ thái độ bình tĩnh, kiềm chế, ngừng các hành động đơn phương làm phức tạp thêm tình hình và thay đổi hiện trạng tranh chấp, không quân chủ hóa, không sử dụng và đe dọa dùng vũ lực. Chỉ có thể giải quyết tranh chấp thông qua những biện pháp hòa bình mới có thể hy vọng có được an ninh lâu dài và bền vững trong khu vực này. Thứ hai, trong tất cả những biện pháp hòa bình, luật pháp quốc tế là biện pháp đảm bảo cao nhất sự công bằng và tính bền vững của giải pháp. Biển Đông không chỉ là vấn đề khu vực mà còn là vấn đề của quốc tế, không chỉ có tranh chấp lãnh thổ mà còn có vấn đề an ninh, an toàn, tự do hàng hải và hàng không. Các nước ở mức độ khác nhau đều có lợi ích và vì thế đều có trách nhiệm trong việc duy trì hòa bình, ổn định, an ninh tự do hàng hải, hàng không và chung nhất là thượng tôn pháp luật. Công ước về luật pháp biển, công ước về biển của Liên hợp quốc năm 1982 về luật biển chính là những giá trị chung phải được tôn trọng và tuân thủ, đặc biệt trước hết là với những nước thành viên của công ước này. Thứ ba, thời gian qua các nước liên quan đã nhất trí được một số công cụ, biện pháp ngăn ngừa va chạm, xung đột trên biển, điển hình là việc ASEAN và Trung Quốc đã nhất trí áp dụng bộ quy tắc tránh va chạm không mong muốn ở Biển Đông, cần mở rộng khung của bộ quy tắc này với các lực lượng tuần tra bảo vệ bờ biển và với mọi tàu thuyền dân sự có mang vũ khí nhỏ để tự vệ, đồng thời vận hành đường dây nóng ngoại giao ASEAN Trung Quốc giải quyết các tình huống bất ngờ trên biển có thể xảy ra. Thứ tư, ASEAN và Trung Quốc cần sớm được một COC mang tính ràng buộc toàn diện và thực chất và trở thành công cụ hữu hiệu giúp ngăn ngừa xung đột, tạo môi trường thuận lợi thúc đẩy giải quyết các tranh chấp bằng biện pháp hòa bình. Muốn vậy, COC cần được xây dựng trên cơ sở tôn trọng những nguyên tắc cơ bản của luật pháp quốc tế, các thỏa thuận quốc tế mà các bên liên quan là thành viên, đặc biệt Công ước về Biển về Liên Hợp Quốc năm 1982 và tôn trọng ý kiến chuyên môn của các tổ chức pháp lý quốc tế. Thứ năm, khuyến khích và ủng hộ các nỗ lực quốc tế, trong đó có nỗ lực của Trung Quốc, ASEAN, Hoa Kỳ, Nhật Bản, Australia, vân vân nhằm đảm bảo tự do hàng hải, khu vực trên cơ sở luật pháp quốc tế, các nước cũng cần đẩy mạnh hợp tác trong các lĩnh vực ít nhạy cảm trên biển, như hoạt động nghiên cứu về khoa học, bảo vệ môi trường biển, phòng chống thiên tai, cứu hộ, cứu đạn và ứng phó với chủ nghĩa khủng bố, cướp biển, buôn người, dư dịch cư bất hợp pháp, vân vân. Qua đó, tăng cường hiểu biết và hạn chế các hành động bộc phát có thể gây hiểu lầm, dẫn đến những xung đột. Về phía Việt Nam, chúng tôi ủng hộ bất kỳ sáng kiến cơ chế hợp tác nào có lợi cho việc duy trì hòa bình, ổn định, thúc đẩy giải quyết hòa bình, các tranh chấp trên cơ sở luật pháp quốc tế, ủng hộ việc triển khai các sáng kiến, dự án hợp tác trên biển và trên cơ sở tuân thủ luật pháp và các thỏa thuận quốc tế liên quan. Tôn trọng và hài hòa lợi ích của tất cả các bên, tăng cường trao đổi thông tin và tích cực phối hợp hành động giữa các chính phủ, các tổ chức quốc tế, các chuyên gia, các nhà học giả về biển, và đại dương vân vân nhằm góp phần xây dựng và thực thi các biện pháp hiệu quả phòng tránh xung đột trên biển. Thưa quý vị, tôi sức mong muốn tại diễn đàn này chúng ta sẽ có những cuộc trao đổi thẳng thắn, chân thành về những gì đang diễn ra hướng tới những giải pháp khả thi hiệu quả cho các vấn đề tại khu vực, trong đó có vấn đề biển Đông vì lợi ích của chính chúng ta 
và những thế hệ mai sau. Xin trân trọng cảm ơn quý vị. Minister, thank you very much for um, that comprehensive introduction for us, including the various initiatives that uh, that are are out there or being being mooted in terms of the uh, the, the uh, issues that we have at hand. Um, I now turn to uh, General Kazuaki uh, Sumida, who is Vice Chief of Staff of the Joint Staff of the Japan, Japanese Self-Defense Force and um, anti-air artillery officer by, uh, by training and in his background. But um, General, please uh, give you your perspective on, uh, on the issue that we are now discussing. On behalf of Admiral Kawano, the Chief of Staff Joint Staff Japan, it is my great pleasure to have this opportunity to participate in this special session of Shangri-La Dialogue 2017. It's a maritime order based upon rules and law, not coercion, which underlies open and stable seas. This can be said to be global commons that is essential for peace and prosperity on the Indo-Asia Pacific region and also of the entire international society. Although maritime order is stipulated in international laws such as the UNCLOS in recent years, there have been increasing cases of unilateral claims by coastal countries sorry to pursue their own interest and coercive attempts to change the status quo. Furthermore, freedom of the high seas and global commons is being unlawfully challenged by piracy and criminal activities such as illegal fishing and narcotics trafficking. These maritime challenges are uh, particularly notable in the Indonesia Pacific region. Violation of sovereignty as well as the intricacy of no, uh, national interest among the countries cause concern for further complication and escalation of the situation. Therefore, political measures to avoid escalation and to manage the practice behind such incidents are essential in the Indo-Asia Pacific region today. It is also necessary for all countries concerned to cooperate together. The first, sorry, with this regard, I'd like to emphasize the following two points. The first one is the rule of law and confidence building to support it. The rule of law is a universal principle which must be respected by the entire international community. Thus, all of the counties concerned should refrain from taking actions which may lead to raised tensions and must pursue a peaceful solution. In addition to UNCLOS, creating and sharing international norms would be an effective way to avoid conflict and prevent escalation. Common rules in the region can ease unnecessary tensions and build confidence among countries concerned under the rule of law. For example, the Qs has been established in the Western Pacific as a standard procedure for preventing contingencies at sea. Ensuring the effectiveness of queues is a tangible initiative in this regard, and I'd like to welcome the effort by the navies involved. Also, I understand that the queues were adopted by the Indian Ocean Naval Symposium in January 2016, which also welcome as expanding the circle of confidence building initiatives. In this respect, let me also mention about Japan and China. The relationship between Japan and China cannot be separated since we both have grave responsibility for the peace and prosperity of the region. As it has been confirmed at the Japan-China Foreign Ministerial Meeting this year, much effort has been made by both sides and the banner of mutually beneficial relationship based on common strategic interest. The Japan Ministry of Defense is also continuing discussions for the maritime 
and aerial communication mechanism aiming for earliest possible implementation. Meanwhile, I hope the ongoing discussion for the COC in the South China Sea will lead to agreement with pragmatic content and coming into force, which will significantly contribute to confidence building as a practical measure to avoid conflict. I'd like to ask each country in the region to act not based on coercion, but based on rule and laws in order to avoid unexpected incidents. The second point I'd like to emphasize for practical measures to avoid conflict is sharing and strengthening regional maritime domain awareness. In the Indo-Asia Pacific region today, the rule of law and sovereignty have been seriously challenged by criminal activities of non-state actors such as piracy, illegal fishing, and terrorism. And each country has been trying to counter these challenges. However, with the diversity of challenges and uncertainty of their, uh, their actions, as well as the vast extent of the ocean, it is evident that countermeasures by a single country has limitations. In order to tackle these challenges, it is necessary to establish a regular maritime situational awareness and to share information among countries. In addition, since there do exist capability gaps among countries, cooperation or capacity building assistance in the field of ISR are needed as well. We have already seen instances of multilateral cooperation regarding the MDA in the region. For example, the Information Fusion Center here in Singapore has been significantly contributing to sharing white ship data. By such effort, countries can share information on destabilizing factors in the maritime domain so that policymakers can be provided with credible information in a timely manner, which will lead to enhanced maritime governance and in turn greatly help to avoid conflict. Moreover, countries have also been working on assistance for MDA capacity building. For example, I'd like to appreciate the Pacific Patrol Boat Program led by Australia as an initiative that has been contributing to stability in the region. Japan also supports countries in the region enhance ISR capabilities through defense equipment and technology cooperation. For example, Japan transport Japan Maritime Self-Defense Self Forces TC-19 aircraft to the Philippines, along with pilot training and maintenance support. In addition, from this perspective, Defense Minister Inada announced a guiding principle for Japan's defense cooperation with ASEAN, the Vientiane Vision at the Japan ASEAN Defense Ministerial Forum in November last year, which includes capacity building assistance. Thus, Japan intends to keep contributing the region in order to avoid conflict. <clears throat> to conclude, I have pointed out two initiatives for practical measures to avoid conflict at sea, namely the rule of law supported by confidence building and enhancing MDA capability. I strongly hope that this measure will be promoted further in the Indo-Asia-Pacific region. And as a result, the region can become a stage for international peace and prosperity as embodying open and stable sea seas. Under the leadership of Prime Minister Abe and acting as a proactive contributor to peace, based on the principle of international cooperation, Japan will also promote its contribution to international society for regional stability and peace. Thank you for your attention. General Smeda, thank you very much, and, and particularly for your um, uh, references and highlighting uh, in terms of practical measures, those issues uh, to deal with, as you say, maritime domain awareness, but also 
capacity building to fill gaps that, that everyone has, really, in terms, of, uh, in terms of being able to have a full spectrum uh, capability and awareness uh, of what is going on. Um, Next uh, in our panel, uh, Rear Admiral Donald G. Gabrielson, uh, U.S. Navy, a surface warfare officer by training, but currently based here in Singapore as Commander Logistics Group, Western Pacific, and Commander Task Force 73. Admiral. Nick, thank you very much for first hosting this session for taking command of what from this side of the table appears to be some sort of spaceship and navigating us through this discussion uh, to the panelists. Thank you for also being part of this and I already can tell we have much in common in our views to discuss today. And to the audience, thank you for giving us your time this afternoon and we will do our very best to not make you wish that you had taken a nap instead. I want to talk about the practical realities and the challenges related to this topic of confidence building measures. It's easy to see the strategic importance and what's at stake. And I want to talk about the tactical level discussion of why we need to do this. And I'm going to start with a short story about human nature. Wouldn't it be great if we could all just say what we mean and have it perfectly understood. In the United States, there's a television commercial that makes fun of this idea. It's for an internet dating site where two people meet for dinner, and then they realize that they really aren't attracted to each other. And so after dinner, they do what people do, and they're exchanging pleasantries. Oh, this was fun. Dinner was great. Let's do it again. And then one of them looks at the other one and says, you're never going to call me again, are you? And the other one says, no, now we're done here. And both people walk away with a perfect understanding of what just happened. And we don't always have that opportunity when we are out operating in the world. And we need to use confidence building measures to create that sort of clarity. Unpredictable encounters cause discomfort. It's human nature. And tribal rituals evolved over centuries to show intent and sometimes to show off. And both sides carefully watch for signs and signals in every move. And fancy signals are easily misunderstood. And history has countless examples of misinterpreted intent. And that is what confidence-building measures aim to avoid. Especially here in Asia, Whereas I live here now for the second time in my life, I've really come to understand that just as often the words that we don't say matter maybe more than the words that we actually do say. And trust depends upon personal ties that really are difficult to build across different cultures with centuries of complex history. But there's a simple idea here. We can't increase trust by interacting less or being unpredictable when we do interact. Trust requires a relationship which requires interaction. And our people are out and about more and more and they will continue meeting in the global commons as the world gets more and more interconnected. Now, As far as we can tell, only North Korea has a, an apparent strategy of self-isolation. And it's either working really well or it's a total failure, depending on your point of view. But the rest of us have more people at sea and in the air, interacting more often, and judging those interactions from their limited perspective, which often falls short. Because our operators don't have the benefit of sitting in rooms like this and conferences hosted by IISS, where we get to meet our counterparts and build the basic idea of a relationship to hopefully improve our ability to trust each other and work together. And so anxious people meeting for the first time typically assume that the other person has some kind of ill intent, and that never helps. And so they need a framework to prevent misunderstanding in those anxious moments. And we know that we've been working together on confidence-building measures for decades. And they're a proxy form of trust. 
And they form a foundation for the stability that's in all of our strategic interests. Confidence-building measures become a sort of internationally understood tribal ritual today. And when they're correctly performed, they keep tactical events from becoming tragically strategic. Above all, confidence-building measures convey discipline, which is perhaps the most impressive characteristic of great capability. And so because of this, confidence-building measures are crucial elements in the rules-based order that we've already been talking about. And the world is watching us as we navigate into the future. And the question is, will we build trust or will we build ambiguity? As the Chinese might say, new ding, peng ji. Will we cook a chicken in a pot made for an ox? So my observations won't surprise anyone in this room today. These are simple concepts, but it's not easy to devise signals that are easily interpreted by anxious people who don't know or understand each other. And as a case in point, we've already seen people in the news media spending their time trying to dissect and interpret what's already been said here in this Shangri-La dialogue. In different cultures, I'm sure we'll find different signs and signals in the same words. But our operators can't afford that kind of misunderstanding on the ground and in the air and at sea. The confidence-building measures, they need to be simple, they need to be universally shared, easily understood, and universally respected. So whenever we create unique systems, some sort of secret handshake, we create mistrust and ambiguity in the perception of who's on the inside and who's on the outside. All nations deserve an inclusive system that respects shared strategic interest, large and small nations alike. And wherever we have agreements already, we must ensure that our forces honor them. And wherever we fall short, we must act quickly to de-escalate with clear intent. And wherever we lack clarity, we must create it and overcome the ambiguity of these anxious moments for our operators in these encounters. So complicated rituals or fancy maneuvers create ambiguity, they create misunderstanding, and they increase mistrust and they increase risk of bad decisions. So as we consider the way forward, I want to offer a simple idea or thought. We have a clear, simple, reliable system of behaviors today in cues, the call regs, and unclause. Let's reinforce that system evolved over seven decades of inclusive multilateral relationships and let's continue talking in clear language about what else needs improvement. Let's get every government agency in the entire region on board. All navies, coast guards, air forces, militias, police, armies, if they're out there interacting with other nations, they need confidence-building measures to do it safely. And there's a lot at stake. We all have talked about that. And the solutions seem pretty straightforward in this light. It's simple, but it's not easy. Thank you very much. Admiral, thank you very much uh, for that. Um, our final contribution in terms of initial uh, remarks from the panel come, comes from Senior Colonel Zhu Bo, who is the Director of the Security Cooperation Center, the Office for International Military Cooperation, the Ministry of National Defense uh, in China. Um, Colonel, over to you. Thank you, Nick. It's really a great honor for me to speak in such a grand ballroom. Actually, before I came in, I was looking for the venue, and I wrongly went to, into the three smaller rooms. I thought it must be one of the rooms, as it happened last year. I came from uh, Sichuan province in China, this name, Sichuan, probably will remind people of the uh, hot and spicy Chinese food. But Sichuan is also known for some other things. Among the things, 
is Sichuan Opera, in which the actor could change his mask within seconds into a different color. So when I read the title of this uh, uh, seminar, Practical Measures to Avoid Conflict at Sea, it, I just have this feeling, because this subject always come back with different masks, not only in Shangri-La dialogues, but also in all the workshops, seminars, and symposiums in the Asia Pacific. So that being said, I believe this is really a topic relevant to all of us. Now, let me come to share my point of view with you. First of all, when we talk about avoiding conflict at sea, the first question that occurred to my mind is, how possible is conflict at sea now in the region? The answer is, not very. The Asia Pacific today is still the main engine of world economy, and we in China believe peace and development are still the major trends in the region. If we compare security on land, especially the security in the Northeast Asia, everybody will conclude that it is much more worsened compared with the maritime security. Due to historical reasons, the maritime territorial disputes are commonly found in this region. Quite a few countries have maritime disputes with more than one country. For example, in ASEAN Charter, one chapter is dedicated to territorial dispute alone. So it is not fair to highlight the dispute between China and some ASEAN claimants. Such a dispute is almost found in every ASEAN country with another ASEAN country. Uh, no country, but the good thing is, no country wish to aggravate disputes. Currently, the situation in the East China Sea and in the South China Sea is by and large stable. The conclusion is the Asia Pacific has no realistic threat of a massive conflict at sea. Then what could we mean by the term at sea? So where is the sea? The sea is an extensive concept which could include the high sea, territorial sea, contiguous zone, exclusive economic zone, or archipelagic waters. The reason behind potential conflicts could be maritime territorial disputes, accidental or unplanned encounters between surface ships, submarines, government vessels, and naval aircraft, as mentioned by previous speakers. Another reason is some countries have maintained closing surveillance and reconnaissance of high intensity and large scale against the littoral states, regardless of the security interests. The difference of governments in interpreting the international laws and difference of countries in handling, in the, in handling with foreign military ships and aircraft in the territorial sea and in the sea under their jurisdiction add to the danger of conflict at sea. So how could we possibly avoid conflict at sea? I give four points. Number one, I think this is voiced by my Vietnamese counterpart, but I raise this probably in a different way. The first point is territorial disputes must be resolved through peaceful consultations and negotiations. That is correct. China not only upholds this principle, but also honors this principle in practice. Ever since reform and opening up, everybody knows China's overall strength, including military strength, has been on the rise. But China hasn't turned this strengthened military strength into triggering any conflict with any other countries. China, for example, has resolved 90% of its land border dispute with 12 countries out of 14 neighbors through peaceful negotiations. China has also resolved maritime delimitation in the Beibu Gulf with Vietnam. 
For those who don't understand what Babe Golf is, I mentioned the Gulf of Tonkin. On the South China Sea issue, China and ASEAN claimants all maintain to resolve the disputes through friendly consultations and negotiations by sovereign states directly concerned in accordance with the universally recognized principles of the international laws and the 1982 UN Convention on the Law of the Sea without use or threat of force. What is particularly encouraging is that last month in Guiyang a province in China, China and the Philippines started the first round of bilateral talks on the South China Sea issue. And it is also in Guiyang the Chinese and ASEAN diplomats concluded the framework of COC, which laid a solid stepping stone for future discussions. Second point, military activities at a close proximity that would be taken by the other country, by the other side as unfriendly or even hostile should be reduced and avoided. This is the most direct and effective way of avoiding a conflict at sea. From time to time, we saw maritime and air incidents in the EEZ caused by closing surveillance and reconnaissance of certain countries in the name of freedom of navigation. Although there are different interpretations of UNCLOS, the convention clearly stipulates that, quote, in exercising the rights of freedom of navigation and overflights, states shall have due regard to the rights and duties of the coastal state and shall comply with the laws and regulations adopted by the coastal states. Unquote. As early as 1998, China has made it clear in PRC law on the exclusive economic zone and the continental shelf that all states shall, on the premise that they comply with international law and the laws and regulation of the PRC, enjoy the freedom of navigation in that flight over its exclusive economic zone. What does that mean? That means when you talk about freedom of navigation to me, remember, you are talking to someone who has made it into its domestic law almost 20 years ago. So China is not a stranger to this concept of freedom of navigation. About 100,000 ships transit through South China Sea every year, and no countries have complained that the freedom of navigation of the merchant ships is affected. It is ludicrous to turn freedom of navigation into an issue and impose one's unilateral understanding of this concept upon others. We hope those countries who claim that they do not have a position on the issue of the South China Sea and that they do not take side don't conduct joint patrol or exercises is in the sensitive waters to add attention to the situation in the South China Sea. Third, the universally recognized international rules and norms must be observed. All countries must implement 1972 Convention on the International Regulations for Preventing Collision at Sea, as my colleague has mentioned, COREC. And the member states of the Western Pacific Naval Symposium, I mean 21 members, should honor 2014 Code of Conduct for Unplanned Encounter at Sea, signed in Qingdao, and follow good seamanship to avoid the danger of collision. All parties should strengthen the control of the front-line troops to avoid conflict. The Chinese and the U.S. military should further enhance mutual notification mechanism of major military activities and the rules of behavior for safety of maritime and air encounters to avoid conflict and confrontation. Finally, dialogues and exercises aiming to avoid dangerous maritime and air military activities should be encouraged. The Chinese Ministry of Defense 
has established direct communication links with the United States, Russia, ROK, and Vietnam. China conducts extensive dialogues and consultations with a number of countries. In 1998, China and the U.S. established a consultation mechanism called MMCA to strengthen military maritime safety. So far, the two countries have conducted a few exercises on cues. Since 2008, China and Japan have con conducted many rounds of consultations on establishing a maritime and air li liaison mechanism. The difference remained is actually not very big. We hope the Japanese side will demonstrate flexibility and work in the same direction with China for an early conclusion of the mechanism. In 2011, China and Vietnam signed an agreement on basic principles guiding the settlement of maritime issues existing between the two countries. So far, the two countries have conducted 22 rounds of joint patrols in the Beibu Gulf. The Chinese military has also attended all maritime security cooperation on the ASEAN Regional Forum and ADM Plus framework. We in China and in China's military stand ready to explore the possibility of setting up a China-ASEAN defense communication link, as mentioned by the Vietnamese gen general just now. Both China and ASEAN are exploring the possibility of conducting a maritime joint exercise next year. We believe all these consultations, dialogues, and cooperation have played a positive role in promoting maritime security and avoiding maritime conflict. Thank you for your patience. Colonel, thank you very much uh, uh, for that contribution. Um, and we now move to uh, the discussion session. Uh, uh, just a reminder of the uh, technical side of things. If you do want to make a, a, a contribution, please um, swipe your, your name badge for delegates, swipe your name badge on the left-hand side of the, the microphone unit. If you're sharing a microphone, you'll get uh, arrows um, uh, left and right. Uh, choose which, which one, depending on where, where you're sitting, and then press either the left or the right uh, silver button to turn your microphone green, and I will, uh, will um, recognize you, and um, we will... Um, we will proceed through the discussion process. I've got a few questions uh, have uh, popped up now, and uh, so we'll get straight, in, straight into the uh, discussions from the floor, I think. And the first, um, first person on my list is um, Azhari Abdulaziz. Um, please, uh, the floor is yours. Is that gone? All right. I've got two questions, actually. Uh, the first question that uh, I see uh, most of the panel has been spoken, uh, spoke about queues. Now, queues has been accepted by the WPNS countries since uh, 2014. Up to now, it has been said that queues is to be extended to the uh, non-Navy vessels, meaning Coast Guards, uh, any other government vessels, and thus far, can any one of the panels uh, highlight to, uh, to the members of the floor what success have we got in extending it to the other government agency vessels? Now, on second question is, what practical measures do you have in controlling fishermen uh, that have got militia on board? And uh, these are guys that might just create or uh, cause the conflict uh, to happen at sea. Those are my two questions. Thank you very much. Um, next, uh, Janet Dia Ekawati Gibson from uh, Indonesia, I think. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, gentlemen. Uh, thank you for your 
explanation and insights on the practical measures to avoid conflict at sea. Actually, my question is quite, it was a bit similar to the uh, first question, but it's interesting that now if you talk about um, at sea, it's not just about navies that are involved in also law enforcement at sea. We have now Coast Guard. Now Coast Guards are playing a much bigger role but at the same time, for example, in Indonesia, we have experiences with other countries' coast guards, including with also with China, and just a few weeks ago with Vietnam. So uh, what's interesting is that, and also mentioned by also the Malaysia Defense Minister, uh, we have fishermen, and again mentioned also uh, military, sorry, maritime militias or paramilitary. So I'm just, I just want to know from all of you in front, uh, what is your opinion on these so-called um, non-Navy actors at sea, if I may, non-Navy actors at sea, and their influence in how uh, we are currently um, using practical measures to avoid conflict at sea? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, those two... Um questions were sort of common themes, so perhaps if I could ask uh, the panelists to, uh, to respond to those. It, it is, it is um, a, a live issue in terms of this uh, platform that we have with queues that, uh, as far as it goes, has been considered something of a, of a success story, and yet, and yet, um, there are the knotty issues of the complexity at sea that we now see, uh, and how, if you like, the recipe that uh, is in queues uh, can be extended to uh, uh, deal with uh, not, not just the types of vessels, but the types of actors. You've, you've all in different ways, um, and I think particularly, Minister, you introduced uh, the idea that there are that there are issues and challenges from trafficking and so on and illegal fishing that, uh, that, that need to be addressed. How knotty a problem, because everyone recognizes it, how knotty a problem is it to, um, to take this on in terms of extending the remit of queues? Perhaps not just in terms of types of categories that are included, but, but geographically as well where we go. Um, uh, Minister, perhaps if you could start us off. À, xin uh, cảm ơn uh, những cái uh, câu hỏi của các uh, các vị. Uh, trước hết về cái uh, câu hỏi của uh, chị ở chỗ Indo, thì uh, tôi cho rằng là chị rất là quan tâm đến cái uh, hoạt động và cái uh, liên quan đến Việt Nam và Indo trong thời gian vừa qua liên quan đến cái uh, ngư dân. Tôi cũng uh, rất là cảm ơn chính phủ Indo đã phối hợp rất tốt với chính phủ Việt Nam. Cho nên là những cái ngư dân Việt Nam trong quá trình công việc trên biển thì cũng có khi lạc vào những ngư trường đánh cá của nước này nước khác thì nhất là khi có những thời tiết không thuận lợi nhưng mà vừa qua cái phối hợp của các nước trong khu vực đặc biệt là giữa Việt Nam và Thái Lan rất tốt thì tôi xin cho rằng đấy là những cái việc cụ thể mà chúng ta đã và đang giải quyết rất là tốt thì câu hỏi thứ hai mà cũng của cái đại biểu Arebori nêu lên về những cái kêu thì tôi cho rằng là các nước ASEAN với các nước liên quan đang xây dựng những cái bộ quy tắc ứng xử cụ thể mà cái bộ quy tắc ứng xử này thì cần phải đi thực chất và phải thiết thực phải báo quát hết được những vấn đề đã và đang diễn ra xảy ra trên biển thì báo cáo với quý vị là chúng tôi đang phối hợp để xây dựng những cái gợi ý của quý vị rất tốt để giúp cho chúng tôi để xây dựng những bộ quy tắc đó làm sao À, những vấn đề mà các vị nêu lên thì có thể xử lý được mà để giải quyết được những cái xung đột có và thể xảy ra ở trên biển à, trong cái thời gian sắp tới. À, một cái câu hỏi nữa là à, Ngài Chủ tịch cũng đã gợi ý và một ý kiến của quý vị nêu lên là những cái chủ thể ở trên biển thì à, chúng ta nêu trong cái phạm vi của cái đối thoại trao đổi lần này là chủ yếu liên quan đến các cái quốc gia chúng ta có liên quan đến chủ quyền ở trên biển nhưng mà khi hoạt động ở trên biển thì cũng có nhiều những cái chủ thể khác tôi nói ví dụ như cái hoạt động về buôn lậu cái hoạt động về buôn bán ma túy cái hoạt động về buôn bán người thì đây là cái chủ thể mà có lẽ chúng ta sẽ có cái trao đổi ở những cái diễn đàn khác 
mà hiện nay các nước ASEAN chúng ta cũng đang tổ chức rất nhiều những cái cuộc họp, những cái diễn đàn như vậy. Cho nên là với những cái chủ thể mà chúng ta đề cập ở đây thì chúng ta muốn nói rằng là những chủ thể trực tiếp liên quan đến cái bảo vệ cái lợi ích chủ quyền an ninh ở trên biển của chúng ta. Thế còn những chủ thể khác chúng ta nêu cũng nêu nhưng mà chúng ta đề cập ở khía cạnh khác thì nó phù hợp hơn. Xin trân trọng cảm ơn quý vị. General, would you like to um, respond? Eto えっと、ミトの通り私はあの陸上自衛官ですので、会場の具体的なことを説明するというのには少し無理がありますけれども、私の知っている範囲でお答えいたします。まず、9ですけれども、これは今から17年前に提唱されて、それから十数年に及
because it creates tension, it creates mistrust, and it creates risk. And that is the kind of thing that uh, I would agree that the risk of large-scale conflict is very, very low. But what we are here to describe is the risk that all of our people mutually together there's a risk to their lives, and those lives matter. And the, the, the livelihoods that they pursue also matter. And we have to find a way in this increasing uh, global common friction to manage that. And that's what we aim to do. Thank you. Colonel Zhu, from your, from your perspective, how, how much of a priority and how much of a challenge is it to to take on the, um, the, the, the extra complications, if you like, of incorporating these, these additional elements in queues? Well, my honest and direct answer is probably queues cannot be applied uh, beyond the Navy. The reason is very simple. Because queues is agreed at the Western Pacific Naval Symposium, it's not a, something agreed, you know, between Coast Guard or some other department. So first and foremost, it is a, a naval agreement. So the other thing is, is it possible to go, to let it go beyond the naval cooperation? Well, the answer probably is more, uh, is not a direct one in that, for example, all countries have a different uh, uh, government law enforcement institutions and they are different. So for the Chinese Navy and for Chinese Coast Guard, they could be different from the role of US Navy or Vietnamese Navy or Vietnamese Coast Guard or American Coast Guard. So they could be totally different. Uh, for, but there is a possibility, for example, the Chinese and the Filipino Coast Guards are talking to each other. The Chinese and American Coast Guard are talking to each, each other. And President Duterte invited the Chinese Coast Guard to help solve the problem of piracy in the south of Sulu Sea. So I believe there is a possibility of a Coast Guard to Coast Guard cooperation. When I talk about a China-American Coast Guard cooperation, which was agreed by my uh, president and uh, former President Obama, uh, in fact, it also raised a question in my head as to where could the Chinese Coast Guard and American Coast Guard meet each other? Chinese Coast Guard is more or less off uh, in the waters of the Chinese coast. But American Coast Guard could be far, far away from American continental USA. Am I right? Sometimes. Yeah, because their role is different. So therefore, when Chinese Coast Guard have cooperation with American Coast Guard as a Chinese, I would say, when would the Chinese Coast Guard have a chance of visiting continental USA? And when would American Coast Guard visit this part of the world? So all these kinds of questions are just questions. But the good thing is, people have realized the importance of such a direct communication between two Coast Guards. So let's go and see. Well, that's an interesting further element to this uh, discussion in terms of uh, the frameworks for going forward. Is, is an international approach the most likely to bear fruit and bear the low-hanging fruit that I think perhaps people are looking for um, in, in terms of being able to build, build confidence? Or, or are other approaches that others might join that are more limited uh, potentially uh, the way forward in some of these in some of these uh, questions. Um, I'll now call um, from the floor um, Hiroyuki Akita from Japan. Th thank you very much. And my question is uh, both to uh, Mr. Cho and also Mr. Gabri Gabrielson. And to Mr. Cho, uh, sorry, excuse me to ask a very journalistic question, but uh, uh, China claims the right uh, for, all, for almost all parts of South China Sea. So does it mean that, uh, uh, does chi China believe that it has a legitimate right to establish air defense identification zone as well as China did in East China Sea? And uh, that is, 
does China plan to do so in the future? And also, is it conducive to, the, uh, to avoid conflict in South China Sea? That is a question to you. And the question for uh, Mr. Gabrielson is, uh, as, we, as I understand, it is important to maintain a proper balance of power uh, to avoid the conflict, as well as uh, you know, communication. And uh, China has already completed the construction of artificial island, and which create a new balance of military presence in the sea. So just by, uh, pro just, uh, by pushing forward freedom of navigation operation, uh, it seems to me that it's not sufficient to fix the, to deal with the new reality because it, it doesn't fix the changing military presence. So in addition to FANOP, what could we do to deal with the new reality? That is my question, thank you. Thank you, and uh, we'll have a second question from Prashanth Paramasarawan from Malaysia. Um, thanks a lot for the opportunity, Nick. Um, my question is for both the Chinese and Vietnamese uh, representatives. Um, I agree with uh, both sets of comments regarding uh, the importance of both the COC, the Code of Conduct, uh, as well as the importance of cues being applied. Um, my questions, though, are uh, in terms of a very specific nature. Given the fact that it has taken us about 15 years, by my count, uh, to get from the declaration of the Code of Conduct to the Code of Conduct, well, the framework to the Code of Conduct, um, what percentage probability would the two of you attach to uh, us having a binding and effective Code of Conduct in the South China Sea less than 15 years from now? Uh, what would your percentage probability be? Um, and my second question with respect to cues is we have discussed uh, it being applied to beyond naval vessels to include Coast Guard and other civilian vessels. But what about uh, Singapore's proposal uh, to extend it to the underwater domain, given that both China and Vietnam are submarine-owning countries? What are your positions on this, and how do you see this proposal going forward? Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, I wonder perhaps if we might, we might actually start there. Um, in your opening remarks, a couple of you have made the point that um, in some ways uh, tensions may have eased uh, in, in recent times compared to concerns uh, a little while ago. Um, it's possible to argue, I suppose, yes, that is true, but maybe it's only a lull. And given the, um, the long gestation periods that we've just been heard about in terms of making progress, um, doesn't, doesn't that make it just as, uh, as concerning? Perhaps, um, again, maybe start with um, uh, the Vietnamese minister to, to address that issue and then, and then the colonel to address the two questions that were, were put to him, including the AIDZ as well. Minister. Tôi thì rất là cảm ơn câu hỏi đó, nhưng mà tôi cho rằng là hai câu đó thì để cho cùng bàn tôi là Ngài Đại tá của Trung Quốc trả lời thì nó sát hơn đúng yêu cầu của khán giả. Thì có gì tôi sẽ bổ sung thêm. But do you have a thought on how long a process it might be to move this further? Uh, theo tôi được biết là chúng uh, các nước đã dành 15 năm mà hiện nay chúng đã có những cái bước uh, tiến rất là quan trọng nhưng mà cái uh, thời gian để khẳng định là bao nhiêu lâu để xong cái này thì có lẽ tôi trả lời thì cũng uh, sợ là trước các cái nhà chính trị cho nên là có lẽ là các nhà chính trị sẽ thảo luận bàn kỹ nhưng cái mong muốn của chúng tôi là sớm có bộ quy tắc ứng xử Gun. 
Well, regarding the question about uh, the possibility of China setting up ADIZ, my answer is very simple. I don't think China has announced at any moment that China <clears throat> has such a plan to do this. Therefore, I'm not in a position to tell you when China will do this. Uh, regarding uh, COC, yes, it takes 15 years for us to uh, uh, have a transition from a DOC to COC, which currently is only at the first initial stage. But uh, that is the most important encouraging step forward. It demonstrates the joint will of both China and ASEAN to resolve the dispute through peaceful means. In fact, when we talk about uh, <clears throat> COC, we cannot uh, forget that uh, most of the uh, things, uh, fundamental points, are already enshrined in DOC. For example, not inhabiting on the unprohibited uh, uh, islands, reefs, shores, and caves, and uh, never threat to use or uh, threat of force. So all these principles, uh, I think, are enshrined in DOC and which will be carried on in COC. Uh, as for whether COC would be legally binding or not, or in some other words, whether it would have some teeth or not, uh, it's uh, still too early for me to comment on this because the Chinese military is not involved in the process of negotiation of COC. It's essentially done between Chinese diplomats and uh, diplomats of ASEAN countries. So at this stage, we only hope uh, for the best, and I believe this is uh, just a uh, great stepping stone for further consultations in the days to come. Thank you. Uh, do, do you have a view on the, the question that was raised about queues? And I mean, you, you mentioned uh, your, your own um, uh, views on the limitations of extending queues, but the question was raised about the submarine environment, which is an issue that's out there, I think, being raised by, uh, by Singapore, and whether it could be extended in the submarine environment more. Well, uh, I don't believe uh, I have read anything regarding the application of a submarine uh, on queues, but uh, I think it's sub some people do raise this issue that we are having more and more submarines in the uh, South China Sea, and actually what is uh, most encouraging uh, at uh, RIMPAC exercise is that there is a seminar dedicated to rescue of submarine, uh, which, in which both Chinese and uh, the U.S. Navy have joined for discussion. Uh, so uh, right now, I would say th this is not uh, obviously uh, applicable uh, because uh, for us to start this negotiation, 21 countries have to sit together to discuss about uh, such a possibility. And it takes time for people of 21 countries to reach agreement because it has to be unanimously agreed. I do remember quite a few rounds of uh, discussions uh, uh, before we could uh, the, uh, conclude the agreement in Qingdao in 2014. One of the most important uh, discussion point is on the uh, uh, geological uh, limitation, uh, geological application, whether we should include uh, any specific mentioning of any geological limitation or not. Thank you. Admiral, do you have a, a view on the submarine question, but also on the, the, the point that was particularly raised uh, and directed to you? For the submarine queues, uh, Singapore has taken a leading role in that discussion, and the United States Navy ha continues to talk to the Singapore Navy about it. We're very interested. We believe that uh, it's an important topic in terms of the shared security, and we appreciate the leadership that the Singapore Navy has. I believe they revealed uh, a new portal recently that's uh, available, and they're looking for uh, nations to... Uh, agreed to participate, and our uh, Navy continues to discuss that with the Singapore Navy. So we are uh, happy to uh, be part of that discussion. And uh, the, the question that was uh, put to you on the balance of power and, you know, wh where we stand sure. with the status quo, as it were. Sure. 
Well, first I have to recognize that uh, my last name does not lend itself well in the Japanese culture. When I used to live there, Gabriel Sansan does not work well, and so I was always called Donsan. So you feel free to use that if, if uh, we have the pleasure of talking in person. Um, but uh, with regard to the, the um, artificial islands, um, we have a great history, as talked about. It's underwater uh, submarine rescue, coast guards. Our navies operate and work together. We go to each other's ports. We have many different things internationally, much more in common than we do apart in our strategic interests. And, and I really need to emphasize that. There's shared interest uh, by, by both countries, by all countries in, in uh, this conference and, frankly, around the world. Um, as far as the artificial islands, it is the United States' position to continue the dialogue here and, and continue to work toward a solution that is acceptable by the global community. And it is our hope that uh, at some point China will come around to uh, uh, find their way to honoring the commitment of the, of the binding arbitration that they signed up to when they signed on to UNCLOS. And that remains our position on that issue. Uh, and so we will continue to pursue the discussions. And we encourage everyone to participate in that. Thank you. Thank you very much. We, we've had a flurry of questions uh, appearing on my screen now. So I'm going to take a, a, a group all together, um, first of which uh, comes from Duc Hai Nguyen from Vietnam. Uh, I share my views so with four speakers' presentations, especially the cooperative mechanism, international laws, including UNCLOS 1982, DOC. However, the situation in the South China Sea continues with the complexity, undermining trust among nations, sometimes making the situation become tense and uncontrollable. My questions go to the four speakers. The first one, confronting such complexity, what political behavior should be to resolve the issues? The second, the re in recent years, countries in the region have implemented correct and keys, but in reality, there are collisions among vessels, especially commercial ships and fishing vessels, causing serious consequences. The vessel that caused accidents run away, making the situation compli complicated, especially dealing with the post-accidents. So, according to you, what sort of practical measures to deal with the cases should be implemented? Thank you. And True, True Yong to Tran, also from Vietnam, is that? Thank you very much. Um, my comment and question to Senator Colonel uh, Zhou Bo. Uh, I fully agree with uh, the assessment that we uh, must uh, differentiate the maritime zones, uh, territory sea, contiguous zone, and exclusive economic zone I see in the sea, and we must observe universal rules, especially unclosed, so that to avoid incident at sea. Uh, in that aspect, I think the clarification of claim is very, very, very important, especially clarification of uh, exclusive economic zones. And all of us know that uh, last year, the uh, arbitration tribunal um, the arbitration brought up by Philippines and uh, in fully uh, in conformal in according to UNCLOS and the tribunal ruled that no feature in Spratly can generate uh, exclusive economic zone and continental shelf. So uh, my question is: Could you um, please define now uh, what China claim in the South China Sea? Especially, especially uh, how big China claims the EZ in the South China Sea, and whether any feature that China claims in Spratly can generate exclusive economic zone. Thank you. 
next on my list, uh, Rajaswari Pillai Rajagopalan uh, from India. Hi, uh, um, uh, thanks for the uh, uh, four uh, speakers uh, on, the, uh, on the issue of practical measures to avoid conflict at sea. But I think one of the first uh, issues to deal with is the uh, how clear is your understanding and uh, the awareness of the total awareness of the environment that we're dealing with. In that sense, I think uh, the Japanese speaker touched upon the maritime domain awareness. Uh, that's an important aspect. But I think it'll be great if we could uh, give us a bit of details in terms of Japan's own capacity, both in terms of the actual capacity, the military capacity to do that, but also in terms of the institutions. Second, it will also be good if you have other maritime partners uh, in terms of collaborating on the M MDA. A second question for the Chinese speaker, uh, you categorically talked about as to how maritime disputes must be resolved peacefully in line with international law. And I think this is exactly the same view that all the di uh, disputed parties have on the maritime disputes, particularly on the South China Sea issue. So where, are, where is, in fact, the problem? Where is a why, why is it there are a lot of tensions around the same issue? Uh, for instance, and I want to ask you in, uh, directly as to how does this militarization of the artificial islands fall or in, is in line with what you said in your opening remarks about uh, uh, resolving their disputes in a peaceful manner? Thank you. Okay, I think, I think we'll stop with that as that's a fairly meaty uh, selection and, and maybe start with uh, Colonel Zhu at, the, at this end. <clears throat> well, I tried to start to answer the last question first about the so-called militarization uh, in the South China Sea. When you talk about militarization, what are you referring to? China is owning, expanding the land upon its own control. And we believe uh, this is a legitimate right. It's not kind of a militarization. On the other hand, how would you consider, for example, the US ships frequent sailing into 12 nautical miles of China-controlled islands, and the daily reconnaissance in China Sea is that Aren't these militarization? So this is a, a question. Calling China's militarization is just a, to smear on China's reputation. We in China, in spite of our claim that, uh, that, that uh, the islands and adjacent water are Chinese sovereignty, so, uh, uh, Chinese uh, uh, territorial water, and a, ter and a territory, we never have threatened to use force against anybody. So could you give me another example that uh, China, having become so strong since its reform in 1979, has used force against any countries? Frankly speaking, let's face the South China Sea issue. In the South China Sea, who have started to kill people? Actually, I could give you three examples of the Filipino Coast Guard who did it to Chinese fishermen. And that is hard facts, which could be Googled easily on website. And could you give me one single example of China using force? So I would argue that China's land reclamation is the only way for China to have its own legitimate self-defense. Regarding uh, the uh, arbitration in the South China Sea, I think China's attitude is quite clear to all because we never accept this result because of our declaration in 2006 about Article 200 98. That means when China signed the agreement, we have already made a declaration that China would not accept any rulings regarding territory or maritime delimitation. That is a, a hard fact. Therefore, we just do not accept in line with what we have already declared. Thank you. 
Admiral, I don't know uh, which elements of the questioning you'd, you'd like to pick up. Maybe in particular, th th this question of complexity keeps coming back, and how do you sort of cut through that? Uh, you know, what, what political behavior was the question that was asked? I mean, what, what, where does the initiative have to start in some ways? Can we bring beer to the next session <laughs> like this? This is a great topic for a late evening um, that really, I think, deserves some savoring uh, beverages of your choice, but th this is really the essence of what we're supposed to be doing in the world, isn't it? We're supposed to be talking to each other, and we're doing that, and we have differences of opinion, and we have different perspectives, and we're supposed to talk them through and work them out and be willing to understand everyone's point of view, which takes time. In, in especially when we're dealing with many countries. But we also have to have some flexibility. And so I think that despite all of our interests uniquely, we must recognize that we as a people on this planet have a shared interest of stability and prosperity. And we need to work together to ensure that future. Uh, with regard to the the question about the, the militarization in, in those pieces, I already uh, addressed most of that, but the, and I think, so I believe sufficiently, I hope. But the one thing I would offer is that it's interesting that China, and it's not the first time I've heard this, says um, they're not militarizing islands, that they are adding military equipment to. But the United States is militarizing an area that we've been operating in since longer than anyone in this room has been alive. And I'm quite confident we will continue operating long after anyone in this room is gone. So that's not different. That's not new. But the changes on the islands which you built, that's new. The equipment on them, that's new. And so I think we do have some things to talk about with that. And I think that's the important thing is that at a national level, between our presidents, between our national leadership, we continue talking about these issues. Thank you. Could I ask a, uh, just, 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 a, just a minute. I, I'd, I'd like to move on because I have some more questions as well to, uh, to deal with. Uh, General, you, you, the, uh, the point was um, made to you about maritime awareness, what capabilities, and, and, and how you take forward um, that issue as far as Japan is concerned. で、まず こういう能力をいろいろな地域に分けていく。そういう隙間がないような体制を今作っていく。で、そのために必要な能力構築の支援であったり、あるいは技術協力、装備協力、こういうものが考えられるのではないでしょうか。例えば、我が国の場合であれ
uh, as many questions as I can, and then I'll invite the panelists to respond to the ones uh, either that are directed to them um, or that they wish to respond to, and, and perhaps make any closing remarks that they, that they have. So uh, the first uh, uh, return to the floor is uh, Zhang Wei Wang from China. Uh, I have a question for Senior Colonel Zhou and Commander Gabrison. It's a, <clears throat> a simple question, but I'm very curious about it. Is that is there a uh, effective channel of communications uh, uh, between China and the U.S. to address emergency situations, say like involving us a, a, a standoff at seas between U.S. and Chinese warships? Can the captains talk to each other directly, and how how they do it? They call each other by telephone or use signal flags or simply use a megaphones. Thank you. Thank you for that, and thank you for being uh, 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 very brief in your answer, uh, your, your question. And I'd, I'd ask the, uh, the others I call also to be brief. Um, Jiran bin Mahadzia from Malaysia. Yes, um, thank you. Um, question for Rear Admiral Gray Wilson, because he mentioned about um, getting other um, government agencies and law enforcement and Coast Guard into, um, uh, into this uh, uh, conflict preventation measures. Now, uh, where would be, uh, how do we start really the ball rolling on this? Because um, I think if we look even at the Shangri-La Dialogue while we're discussing all these measures, uh, representatives of those agencies aren't, aren't around to discuss these matters. So what would be the forum format? And on what level do it to go to the State Department or to the military on the military level or foreign ministry level to discuss these measures? Because uh, we're talking about basically um, not navy to navy, but more of a whole of national government approach on this matter. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Lynn Kwok from Singapore. Thank you. Um, I have two points. The first one uh, is directed to uh, Senior Colonel Joe. That was a really impressive presentation. Thank you very much for that. Um, I think in terms of uh, measures to avoid conflict at sea, I think we can also, we shouldn't only be looking at uh, keeping within our technical rights, but also exercising prudence and restraint. So when you talk about China being within its rights in terms of militarizing features in the South China Sea or putting weapons on them, um, I wonder whether China would take its own advice that was directed to the Philippines a little while ago, a little over a month ago, when it told the Philippines, um, when, the, when President Duterte uh, warned that he would send troops to occupy the features that um, the Philippines um, occupied um, and plant flags there. I think China told the Philippines that it should exercise prudence and it shouldn't raise tensions in the region. Um, so that even though uh, the Philippines might have a technical right to, to send its troops there, that it shouldn't do that and the Philippines adhere to such advice. Um, will China follow its own advice in terms of uh, planting weapons in the South China Sea? And the second question really is, um, you mentioned the differences in interpretation um, of UNCLOS between the United States and China, and really, re really between the majority of countries um, who have signed up to UNCLOS and China. Um, would China be amenable to discussions to, uh, to reach a sort of compromise or understanding on uh, the rights vested under international law? You mentioned that China does uh, not adhere, or, uh, sorry, not obstruct freedom of navigation in the South China Sea. That is true in terms of uh, civilian vessels and its right to navigate between point A to point B. However, there are certain other uh, basket, there's a basket of rights that the U.S. defends under its U.S. Freedom of Navigation Program, including the right to, um, to, to enter territorial waters without uh, notification or authorization, as well as the right to survey in the exclusive economic zone um, of, uh, uh, to conduct military surveillance in the exclusive economic zone of countries. And so I was wondering whether China would be amenable to such discussions. Thank you. Thank you. And finally and briefly, please, uh, Toshia Umahara from Japan. Thank you. Um, I, I will be brief. Uh, uh, my question is to General, uh, General Sumida and uh, Senior Colonel Ryuju. And in, your, uh, in each of you, could you give me uh, some, uh, give us some clarification 
as to why, uh, what are the, the remaining obstacle in setting up a, a, a defense hotline between China and, and uh, Japan, especially uh, the maritime and air liaison mechanism. Thank you for being brief. And uh, a, a very good point that uh, comes uh, together with some of the others that have been made uh, just now. Um, we're about to bust our um, deadline, so I will start uh, in, in, in the opposite order in which we uh, had our initial discussions and, and, and go down the line from this end. But one, an, an interesting point in all of this was, um, in terms of practical measures, who has, who has the phone numbers? Of the right, do people have the right phone numbers? And at what level is that? And which agencies are the key ones in terms of uh, conflict prevention and hotlines, that sort of thing. But anyway, Colonel, Colonel Zhu, uh, respond to that. And as I say, anyone who would like to make any final remarks to sum up the, the, the session from their perspective. Colonel. Well, <clears throat> in terms of the crisis management mechanism between China and the US, we actually have uh, more than one mechanism. First of all, as early as 1998, China has established a direct communication link with the United States. In the same year, we established the same, uh, same telephonic link with Russia. Russia, uh, half a year earlier, while US followed in the same year. And as I said before, in, uh, again, interesting, in the, in the same year, 1998, China and the United States have signed an agreement uh, just uh, discussing about any maritime issues. However, over the years, it's a, the discussion found at this uh, mechanism is always a bit like a chicken and egg discussion. Because China, China would argue that if you do not come, then where is the danger? Why don't you reduce your reconnaissance and surveillance? Why would you do it on a daily basis? And Americans would uh, quote uh, Unclos to say, for example, in, in Article 58, that all countries enjoy freedom of navigation over, and over flight. And China will say yes, but look at the, the third paragraph of the same article which I quoted. In, in my reading just now, in, in, in doing so, you got to pay due regard to the rights and the duties of the littoral states. So I personally led a Chinese delegation to, uh, to Pentagon for discussion on freedom of navigation. The truth is we just agree to disagree because we can never agree on the same definition. And why is that? The most important thing is, remember, on close is a, a product of compromise, a product of nine years negotiations, the longest in history. Therefore, there are so many loopholes in the UNCLOS that are not fulfilled. Therefore, it opens to many different explanations. And the countries, of course, would make use of the loopholes to justify their own position. Uh, so when we talk about uh, the crisis management between uh, China and US, I mentioned the direct communication line, which sometimes is talked uh, as a hotline. But in 2015, China and the US have it upgraded to let it become a kind of video telephonic communication. That means when we talk to each other, I can read your eye. So that, I believe, is a great progress. And apart from that, the most important mechanism we have established is what we agreed in 2015, the two mechanisms that I have talked about. One is a notification of major military activities. For example, what are you going to do in my periphery? Because China's concern and American concerns are different, but still they have a major impact upon the psyche of the other side. So we signed that. That is a historical document. This, the second one probably is more important, uh, what we call the ROB, Rule of Behavior uh, for, maritime air, for the Safety of Maritime Air Encounters, which actually is a further development uh, from Coraleg and the Cuse. This is most important in that it laid the ground for China and the US to manage possible a crisis. But how can we successfully manage crisis? We have been doing 
cues exercises, and I would encourage China and the U.S. to do more cues exercises wherever they meet at sea. The truth is, Chinese Navy and American Navy definitely will meet more often in the in the waters of the world because the Chinese Navy is becoming a global navy. Therefore, it's not only in China is that, but in any waters of the world. Whenever the two navies meet, they should observe same rules and regulations. The second question regarding self-restraint、uh, asked upon China. I think, as I have made clear in my presentation, that it, that ever since China's reform and opening up, this is a hard fact. China didn't use its strengthened military power. Into triggering any conflict. During from 1979 until now, how many crises China has gone to? Chinese embassy in Yugoslavia was bombarded. Chinese aircraft was crammed into in the air, and there are so many challenges. But and even in the border along between you know in the border between China and India. There are still sometimes some disturbances, but as one Indian scholar remarked, it's a miracle that in over 50 years, not a single bullet is fired across the border. So you can count on China's patience, restraint, and goodwill, which is demonstrated, as I said before. In that China has resolved its land border dispute with 90 percent. Ninety、uh, percent of the border dispute with twelve countries. So China is not short of either self-restraint or goodwill. About the relationship between China and the Philippines, probably it would be interesting for you to know that now China provides Philippine military assistance, including weapons. So China's moderate increase of weapons on those islands would not be a threat to the Philippines at all. China's relationship. With the present due to Tay, is very much improved compared to the relationship with his predecessor. So this is in our mutual interest. The last question is not only addressed to me, but also equally to the Japanese general, as to why China and Japan cannot reach the mechanism. That's a good question. It's not all right for me to disclose what is being discussed, but as I have pointed out, we two countries basically have agreed on the majority of issues, but only something small is left. What I wish is the Japanese side should remember that both China and Japan signed. Cues in Qingdao, so that means the same rule would apply to China when China and Japan are discussing the same issue. So this is the only extent to which I can talk on this issue, and this is what I said in my in my presentation. We hope the Japanese side can demonstrate flexibility and walk in the same direction for an early conclusion of the mechanism. Thank you. Admiral,、uh, your final thoughts, parting shots, as it were.、Um, thanks. We have a great coordination mechanism. It works and it helps. Ships at sea, which I think was part of the question, have the ability to communicate with each other through VHF, bridge-to-bridge -bridge radio, and when they're close enough to land,、uh, cell phones and other networks. Our embassies, our country teams in each country have. Uh, very close personal relationships with all the right people. So when it comes to the question of whether or not we have the ability to move quickly on information,、uh, yes, we do, and we exercise that、uh, capability、uh, frequently for many things of small and great consequence between、uh, not just the United States and China, but the United States and every nation. And I know that that works across the board here.、Uh, there's always room to do better, and we're all looking to do that. Um, with regard to the, the question of, of the unclause and the, and the、um, 
the compromise and all of those other things, the, I guess the only thing I would offer there is that you did sign it, and I'll leave it at that. Um, with regard to our navies operating together in more and more places around the world, I think you know this, and we, we work together in many places. We welcome the Chinese Navy's participation in the global commons, in the global uh, world order, and, and we uh, look forward to working together. But it's very important for everyone to understand that these relationships are not just about the United States and China. All nations, large and small, need to have the same system, the same security, the same benefits, the same guarantees, the same stability, the same hope for the future. And we cannot get that by just working bilaterally with each other on those issues. So Rizwan, to your question, that comes back around to the same challenge, which is how do you get more countries to participate? And that is something that the United States cannot do in and of itself. I cannot make two countries get together and talk. And so we encourage the leadership of every nation to get together and agree for their own security and for their own prosperity to do that, because that's what it's going to take in order to assure those two things. And then I think the last thing is, is that um, this forum is important for us. I appreciate the chance to sit down next to someone I've never met before. We've had a great discussion. Thank you to, the, to our panelists from Japan and Vietnam. Uh, and, and I look forward to working together in the future on the things that we have that are very important. Thank you. Thanks, Admiral. Um, General, you have some final thoughts. え、日中防衛当局間の海空連絡メカニズムについてご質問いただきました。え、この事前日中首脳会談の中で Thank you, General. And uh, General Yu Van Nam, uh, the, last, the opportunity for the last word falls to you. Uh, thì các ý kiến nêu lên thì thấy rằng khu vực của chúng ta bên cạnh cái sự hòa bình ổn định phát triển thì vẫn đang tiềm ẩn những vấn đề mà chúng ta cần phải trao đổi và cái rất quan trọng ở đây là chúng ta phải tiếp tục xây dựng cái lòng tin đối với nhau à, vấn đề thứ hai như các vị đã nói là chúng ta phải uh, giải quyết những bất đồng bằng biện pháp hòa bình uh, trao đổi và trên cơ sở luật pháp quốc tế và cái thứ ba là chúng ta cần sớm xây dựng những cái bộ quy tắc ứng xử cụ thể một cách thực chất mà có tính ràng buộc thì tôi nghĩ rằng cái hội thảo hôm nay rất là bổ ích cũng như là các cái đồng nghiệp của tôi đã trao đổi à, chúng ta hẹn gặp nhau và sẽ tiếp tục có những trao đổi hữu ích như ngày hôm nay trân trọng cảm ơn quý vị Thank you very much, General. Um, 
I'm going to draw this session to a close. I have one final um, housekeeping announcement before I uh, ask you to show your appreci appreciation for the panel, um, and that is those who are guests who have been invited to the Istana dinner uh, later this evening, you're asked to assemble in the island ballroom foyer, just outside, um, at uh, 1900 at 7 o'clock, so in half an hour's time. I'm going to get into trouble because I've let this session uh, overrun uh, uh, somewhat, but uh, I think it was worth it, and uh, I think we've had a, a good discussion during the co course of this whole session. I thank you for your interest. I thank you for um, your questions. Uh, I'd now like to ask you, in the uh, traditional manner, to thank an extremely good panel for an extremely good session. Thank you very much. Thank you.